Okay, last but not least, Professor Chris Goldenstein. Um, he is working on developing new optical diagnostic techniques and applying them probably in the hardest application he can find, so combustion application, so um, fiery detonation balls, things like that, right? So using laser absorption spectroscopy, um, his group has de um, developed new diagnostic techniques for mid-infrared planar laser-induced fluorescence imaging. So I'm hoping there's some really cool pictures in his presentation. No? Okay, darn. All right, never mind. <laughs> um, so Chris has earned a lot of um, early career awards. So he earned a Young Investigator Award with the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, the DTRA, Defense Threat Reduction Agency, an early career award with NASA, as well as a career award from NSF. Um, I've gotten to know Chris pretty well because he served on our graduate committee for the last few years. And he may look like a young, innocent guy, but he is quite wise for his age. He always has uh, good opinions and lots of wisdom. Um, so it's always a pleasure to work with him on these committees. So with that, Chris. Man, thank you, Nicole. <laughs> yeah. A true story. My my mother did always say I, I was uh, an old soul, so I, I think that comes through on the grad committee a bit. But um, yeah, thanks everyone for for coming. Uh, I guess the the title of this says it all. I mean, this is going to be all about my journey to becoming an associate professor, and really this is a, a story about people. And uh, it started in uh, basically the suburbs of Chicago. I was born and raised in. Uh, Downers Grove. I went to Downers Grove South. It's a big public school there amongst many in the Chicagoland area. And at, uh, I guess at that time I was uh, thinking about following a pretty uh, ordinary career path. I really liked working on cars. I actually uh, rebuilt the engine on a 67 GTO with my dad when I was in high school. And so I, I kind of had a passion for mechanical engineering and, and working on cars. And so where would I go to school? Uh, I wonder. I went to the University of Michigan. Uh, I thought it, I would probably join the auto industry. And I worked with two really amazing faculty members in the Walter E. Lay Automotive Lab there. Um, one being uh, Volker Sick on, on the bottom, and then on the top right there's uh, now President uh, Dennis Asanas at the University of Delaware. But when I knew him, he was just a lowly NAE member at the University of Michigan running the auto lab. So, uh, you know, he was really an inspirational person in, in my career. Um, if anyone had the pleasure of taking a class with him, you know, you just sat there and, and felt inspired to work on, on the things he worked in. And um, so he taught me a lot about internal combustion engines, and uh, so did Volker Sick. And, and uh, I guess Volker Sick might have had the bigger impact on me in particular, because he taught me about laser diagnostics um, and how you can use beams of light to, to visualize molecules and turbulent flows and reacting flows. And um, uh, that kind of set me on a path to go work for uh, Ron Hansen at Stanford University. Um, so I did my PhD with, with Ron and I actually learned and worked on a, a different type of laser spectroscopy, but laser induced fluorescence has kind of always been my, my original passion, I guess. Um, but I, I worked with Ron, I was there for five years with my PhD and then an extra year uh, as a postdoc and he's kind of always been a, a guiding force. Uh, this really strong voice in the back of my mind, if he ever watches this, he'll he'll probably uh, get a kick out of it, but um, just a, a really amazing mentor. Um, and uh, when I was there, he gave me the opportunity to work on a lot of different things and a, a lot of different projects, which was, which was great. Um, and you know, by doing that, I got to write a lot of uh, papers and, and even uh, get started on my path to being, being a true academic to, by writing a book. So I, I got to co-author a textbook with him before I graduated. But I think one of the, the most unique things about what I did there uh, was I actually started a company with four, uh, three other fellow lab mates uh, called Spectraplot. And uh, that company is focused on doing exactly what its name says. Uh, we actually built a, a web app for simulating molecular and atomic spectra in the cloud. And I'll talk more about that um, in just a few moments. Um, but basically, I, you know, I was there and that, by that point, I was basically knew I, I wanted to become a professor. And so I hit the job market and I, I landed here at Purdue, um, probably no, no mistake, I, I, two of my faculty mentors, uh, Bob Lucht and Steve Sun, are, are fairly close colleagues with uh, Professor Hansen, and uh, they've really helped me get my start here at, at Purdue, and um, I guess the, the rest is, is history. But the, 
this brings me to my, my next point, which is the first key to success for all the young people is surround yourself with great mentors and, and peers. Um, I didn't have the opportunity to talk about many of the peers, but um, they play just as big a role in my career path as, as the people I'm showing pictures of here uh, today. Okay, so then here's that, I guess all that led to this, right? Uh, that's why uh, uh, part of what I love about my job is the fact that I get to work with all these, these great students and, um, and, and get to help them achieve the goals that um, I, I achieved and so fondly look back on. Um, so this is my, a picture of my group. It's fairly current. Uh, there's about 12 PhD students in it. Um, and uh, we're all, all basically shooting lasers at some kind of reacting, reacting flow. Okay, so that brings me to this point, which is what do we, exactly do we do here? Um, so we're always trying to advance the thermal sciences. Uh, I think we tend to, we work on a lot of applications, but we're often very interested in fundamental aspects of those applications. So I said we try to advance the thermal sciences, but in doing so, we also try to advance energy propulsion and, and defense applications. And in everything we do, we're using laser or optical diagnostics. So this is kind of a, a, a CAD rendering and, and photo of some of the lasers we use. We use some lasers that are as big as an optical table that produce femtosecond pulses. Uh, we use other lasers that can fit in the palm of your hand, the, you know, basically semiconductor uh, lasers like diode lasers and quantum cascade lasers. And we've really tried to develop fundamentally new methods of measuring um, gas properties and, and maybe even liquids um, through detecting uh, light matter interactions. And we don't just do that for fun, right? We, as I said, we do this to advance a whole wide range of applications in science, whether, whether it be you know, trying to measure temperature, pressure, and carbon monoxide a million times a second behind a detonation wave, uh, or characterize all the different chemicals that are formed when you burn a propellant uh, to get approved understanding of uh, combustion of solid propellants, um, or to characterize essentially the thermochemical evolution of post-detonation fireballs to, for example, understand uh, the radiation that's coming out of these. Uh, that's obviously a, a hot topic for a variety of defense applications. Uh, you can't understand the radiation coming out if you don't understand the thermodynamic state of the fluid. And then last but certainly not least, uh, we are, are increasingly working in an area that's kind of near and dear to my heart, which is um, non-equilibrium flows and hypersonic applications. And there, you know, you have, uh, as Nicole alluded to, I guess really with all of these, you have almost the most difficult uh, environment you could imagine studying. Uh, you, you might have gases at temperatures that well exceed that of the surface of the sun, say 10,000 Kelvin. And basically everything falls apart, everything reacts. Uh, and we have to try and quantify that chemistry that's occurring behind, say, really strong uh, shock waves. And then as that super high temperature gas flows onto, say, a, a heat shield material. And uh, that's the focus of, of one project that we're working on for NASA right now, uh, motivated by the Dragonfly mission to Titan. Uh, it all rides on the heat shield, right? If anyone's seen Apollo 13, they know the heat shield is, is key to any space mission, right? And NASA's going uh, to Titan uh, because it's just a, a really am amazing um, place in the solar system to, to try and understand about the origins of life and et cetera. But uh, that, that atmosphere is a, a lot different than our own. It's uh, about 95% nitrogen and 5% methane. And when you enter that atmosphere at say Mach 10 or 20, uh, that, uh, there's a shock wave out in front of that vehicle that then uh, shock heats the gas and actually produces a lot of uh, CN. And CN then radiates like crazy. So it's actually the dominant source of heat transfer to the heat shield. And so what we're doing is um, doing experiments in my shock tube to try and understand uh, basically the, the thermochemical path that CN takes uh, as it uh, basically is born uh, right behind the shock wave and then dumped into a bunch of different quantum states. And so we're measuring uh, six internal temperatures of CN uh, that are related to its population in different rotational and vibrational states uh, in its ground electronic state. And so it's not just one temperature. We're measuring six that belong to one molecule. So it's a really unique um, problem that has uh, been responsible for me losing a lot of sleep over the last year, as Vishnu could probably tell you. Um, but super, super interesting to, to try and uh, to see this, develop new tools that enable us to see this, and then try and understand why this is happening. Um, I won't get into it much more because I don't have time, um, but it's a, a really interesting uh, non-equilibrium problem. Okay, so uh, the future's in the cloud. I think we all, we all know this, and now ChatGPT can solve any problem that we can dream of, right, by just asking it a question, right? Um, but so in 2014, uh, myself and three fellow lab mates 
we're sitting around thinking that we should put spectroscopy in the cloud, right? Spectroscopy is a really, really confusing field. Um, it's just riddled with different conventions and no one really properly explains which one they use and which units they're using. So we wanted to kind of bring down that barrier um, and develop a web app uh, that could simulate atomic and molecular spectra um, by just uh, knowing, say, the temperature, or the pressure, or the composition of the gas you're interested in. We saw that spectroscopy was moving its way into many different areas of engineering, and we thought you, don't, you shouldn't have to be a physical chemist to, to use this uh, powerful area of science. And so we developed this web app. It's now been uh, used over a million times by 4,000 users in over 70 countries. And it all started with just trying to make something uh, so easy that even an engineer can use it, right? It's kind of a plug at the arrogant chemical physicist out there. Um, but engineers use this stuff too, and we can even use it on, on our phone now with this, with this web app. So this is an area of service that I thought was pretty unique, um, and actually something that I'm, I'm really, really passionate about uh, beyond the more traditional things that, that us professors work on, like um, serving on committees and things. Okay, so um, how am I doing on time? Okay, four more minutes. I got plenty of time. Uh, so I, f I thought I would take a moment for the students in the audience to just share some advice. I think I, I kind of took like perhaps the most direct path you could take uh, to become a, a professor. Uh, I guess I kind of knew I wanted to be a professor from midway through undergrad and then just followed a, a straight line more or less with a little bit of wiggling, but a pretty straight line. And it was kind of boils down to these, these areas. Um, one is just pursue your passion, right? If you love what you do, then you never have to work a day in your life, right? My dad said that to me a thousand times growing up. But um, being an academic, you get to choose, especially if you have tenure, uh, what, you want, what you get to work on, right? And so another one of my mentors said, if you're a professor and you don't like what you do, it's your fault, right? Which I find to be pretty true at this point. Uh, and, and what that means is that you should really be pursuing your passion, right? Work on the things that you're most interested in and, and do so in a way that you can make a contribution and, and have impact. Um, the second one is one I, I already alluded to, um, but it's you really gotta surround yourself with great, great mentors. Uh, if you're able to do that, it makes everything uh, easier. Uh, I guess then the question is what makes a mentor great, right? Well, there's no one right answer, but uh, in my opinion, it's find people that inspire you. I think that's why I became a professor is I, I uh, got to interact with so many professors that inspired me to become one. Um, and then also those that support you, because you're gonna need support. Uh, it's a very difficult journey to get a PhD and then go through the tenure process um, and put in all those long outer hours. And then last, you really need someone that's gonna push you. Uh, people that coddle you and do nothing but support you are really not gonna help you on this journey. Um, you need that once in a while, sure, but you really need people that are gonna push you towards ec excellence. Uh, the third point is advice I actually got from, from Volker Sick when I was just starting at Purdue. And uh, he said the best advice he ever got as an untenured professor was, don't worry about what other people are, are doing, right? The, the success that they achieve. Just keep your head down, focus on uh, what you want to do, and, and figure out how to do that well. And uh, I think that's really, really good advice, you know, because you're always tempted to look at uh, someone around you that's having success or winning some big grant or inventing some new thing. And you just got to worry about what you're working on. Um, do your thing, right? If you're not doing your thing and, and doing something unique, then uh, I think you're, you're making a huge mistake as an academic. Uh, the last is a, also some good advice that I got from my advisor. And um, it's definitely not the only reason to become a professor, but I think it's a pretty good one. Uh, that if you want to become something uh, that you're the best of the world at, uh, I think that's a really good goal that realistically you may never achieve, right, if you're being honest, right, but maybe become one of the best in the world at something, right, because everyone thinks they're the best in the world at, at some point, right. Um, but yeah, just being able to work towards something um, that you can become one of the, the best of the world at, I think is a really special uh, thing that not many careers enable you to do. All right, so with that, I then want to take a moment to thank um, uh, some very important people. And uh, I'm going to start with uh, my first three PhD students, actually. So uh, Ryan Tanson, Garrett Matthews, and, and Morgan Roosh, um, they all left my, my group within the last one or two years. 
But they were my first three, and, and everyone knows that your first students are extremely special, right? Because they believe in you uh, and your ability to take them across the finish line before you even have a lab, right? And uh, sometimes I wonder, what did I say to them, you know, that convinced them that I would be able to deliver on all these big promises that I, that I made to them? And so I must have said something right, because I got three really outstanding students uh, to start my career here. And they make everything easier, right? Everything easier. Uh, so they were really, really special. Um, and I wouldn't have my, my lab without them. Um, left an amazing impact on my group and, and my lab and continue to be supporters of my current students. And um, I guess everyone that's been through this process also knows that uh, you need a lot, of a lot of emotional support. And so my, my wife is shown here and our, our uh, two-year-old daughter, Isla. And, um, my wife's been with me since um, early in graduate school. And so she's had to put up with just an absurd amount of insane behavior that it takes to become an, an academic. Um, working on Sundays, waking up in the middle of the night to write something down, um, work on a code, et cetera. Um, and it's just really given me tremendous support and, and made this uh, path a lot easier. And then uh, last but not, but not least, uh, my mom, who unfortunately I actually lost uh, last year, but she was, uh, basically the, the perfect mother, you know, basically provided me with um, unwavering support and love and, uh, you know, never hesitated to, to, to support me in, in going off to get a, get a PhD uh, and uh, always encouraged me to follow, follow my, my passion. So without her, there's obviously no way I, I'd literally be standing here today, uh, but also uh, figuratively. And uh, I think that's it. So then I, I just want to say one more thing, which is to thank all of my current students, right? So the first three are always very special, but um, the rest of them are special too, right? Just because the first three are really special doesn't mean the others aren't either. Um, and so I'm really fortunate to advise a tremendous group of, of students that uh, um, make my job, you know, just uh, extremely rewarding and enjoyable. Okay, so then I'll leave it open for any questions. One of my current students. As a fourth student, I have seen your group like triple in size in the last four years. Yeah. How do you best manage that part of the <laughs> job, like the, the rapid growth and acceleration? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, it, you really have to change uh, how, how you manage it, as you know, right? Uh, with your first students, uh, you're the postdoc also. You're the senior PhD student, you're the postdoc, and you're the, the advisor when you first start. So you have to wear at least three hats to, to start a research group. Um, but that actually, in my opinion, needs to end, right, to be a, a proper uh, advisor, right? And you have to peel away to give your students time to think independently, right, to, to sit in the corner by themselves, right? Sorry, guys. Um, to think about what, what they're doing and why they're doing it, right? So in a way, uh, scaling has, has forced me to do that in some capacity, and that's really the only, the only answer, right? You can't, you, if you have 12 students, you can't mentor them the same way you mentor two, but I think it, it's an, a really interesting and essential correction that's unavoidable that's in the mentoring system, um, that you basically change your style and one for the, for the better, I think, on um, the terms of long-term development of the students uh, to force them to become more independent, independent thinkers. Um, and, and that's kind of what I've done. Uh, but it's definitely a work in progress. It's not easy to do. Other questions? So, thank you for the great talk. Mm -hmm. It was very nice to know how you basically grew into being a professor. That was very nice. Mm. Uh, my question was, uh, is sort of similar to his question on, um, it's more about how do you have the time to, you know, dig deep and, you know, involve yourself in research when you have a lot more number of students to mentor? Like, do you still get the time? Because that's something that I am a little anxious about that mm -hmm. in the future, if I become a professor and I'll have to guide it, maybe I won't have the time to do the research myself. Yeah, well, there's only so many hours in the day, <laughs> right? So. Is you, when you become a professor, you're asked to do a million things, 
And so inevitably, you, you, are, you do not have as much time to, to just focus and think about research as you did when you're a PhD student and a postdoc. And I'll share something that my advisor told me, which is that uh, you're going to look back on your career and think that when you're a, a basically a PhD student and a postdoc, your life was never simpler, right? Because you got this opportunity to just think about science and, and work on technology, and it's really a special time in your career. The good news is, is you get better at that. So you can do it faster, right? And then if you can do it faster, then you can work on more things while still having 24 hours in a day. But I won't lie, um, you know, you definitely stretched across more things. And you just have to constantly be kind of evaluating your balance, I think, right? And say, am I happy with how much time I'm spending on things? Am I unhappy? If I'm unhappy, I got to make a correction of some kind. And for me, it's, it's still very important to not lose connection to the, the science and the engineering that's done in my lab. If, if I don't understand how something one of my students has produced works, um, I'm extremely unhappy, right? So I still make sure that I at least understand the fundamentals and, and, and the big picture. Um, so I think that's essential for me then moving forward. But I won't pretend uh, to say that I, I know how to run all the equipment in my lab. That's definitely not true. Um, so it just changes a bit and you just have to find new balance. It's a great question. Yeah. I also had the age. same concerns when I was when I was your age. Any other questions? Oh, thanks. Oh, oh I went the wrong way. Can you pass it? <laughs> thanks for the talk, Chris. Very nice. Uh, I was curious about the the comment you made about writing a book yeah. during your PhD. Yeah. Since uh, I've I've been thinking about that as well, but but I. Uh, the task just seems daunting. Yeah. And so, so my question is, how did you, how did you manage to find the time while finishing your PhD dissertation to also contribute to the book? Yeah. I mean, well, I'll say it helps if there's th if there's three authors. Yeah. <laughs> so that's for step one, right? And uh, I won't take uh, excess credit for it. So you know, we also certainly benefited from the fact that my advisor had, been, had a course reader that had been fine tuning over 30 years. You know, um, so we had a great starting point to kind of catapult the process. And then um, myself and a fellow lab mate um, wrote a few additional chapters and helped form it into a, more of a textbook style. So we had an amazing starting point. I think without, if you were starting from scratch with nothing to work on, that probably would, would not be possible to do while, while doing a PhD. Um, but yeah, it is a, a big effort as anyone that's gone through it will, will tell you. Um, so I think start with as much material um, and be open to co-authors <laughs> as you can. Okay, I think that's all we have for today. Thanks so much to Chris and to all of our speakers. Um, well, one second. Yeah. Uh, be before you all get away, right? <laughs> so I I'd just like to thank the speakers. I, I always find these talks inspiring, and we're looking forward to even more great things from you. Now, those of you that have read your email before coming here know that we will soon have a new Dean of Engineering. And uh, having worked with Arvind Rahman very closely now the last three years in my two tours of duty, I can say that there could not be a better choice. The College of Engineering is in great hands. And we're going to ask Arvind to say a few closing remarks now. Arvind? Thank you, Mark. You know, I was just going to say that uh, I'm still Associate Dean. <laughs> And I was just going to do my job and just tell everyone, hey, remember, April 10th, uh, we're going to meet again uh, to celebrate um, the careers of uh, four additional, you know, four other faculty members uh, from four different schools. Um, you know, ever since we started this program, I really love to see how this has grown. Uh, so many faculty students join. And, you know, you really get to see what makes success and beyond just the papers and you know, what is it about people's character, uh, about their relationships with others that are essential to success. And um, certainly looking ahead, um, I look forward to seeing a lot more of this happen. And remember, it's a huge college, and we have great faculty and staff, and uh, we'll do a lot more to learn about each other and what makes us tick and succeed. So I look forward to that. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it.